ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to this, the third webinar, as part of the Head Foundation's COVID-19 What Next series. My name is Vignesh, and I will be your host for today's webinar. Today's webinar is extra special for us at the Head Foundation. Not only are we fortunate to have three distinguished panelists joining us today to share and discuss something that is at the core of the Head Foundation's many activities, looking at the impact of COVID-19 on higher education, but also it marks the launch of a special issue of the Foundation's flagship publication, HESB, Higher Education in Southeast Asia and Beyond. In this special issue, which can be downloaded on our website, we look at the impact of COVID-19 on higher education, not just in the region, but beyond. We also listen to what distinguished experts have to say about what the future of higher education might look like following this pandemic. And ladies and gentlemen, it's our great privilege today to have the editor of HESB, Mr. Lok Ho Yong, to moderate this afternoon's webinar. So I'd now I'd like to hand over to my colleague and my friend, Mr. Lok Ho Yong, to introduce today's panelists. Ho Yong, please. Thanks very much, Vignesh, for the kind words. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. The COVID-19 pandemic has left no aspect of modern life untouched, and higher education is no exception. If higher education is the harbinger of the future as it rightly is, it should concern us all how the crisis has impacted universities and colleges in Asia and beyond. E-learning, online learning solutions, seem to have been the magic solution after the physical campuses of universities have had to shut down. On one level, that makes a lot of sense if we think of how best we should prepare the next generation for the digital era of work. But perhaps that is not what higher education should only be about. Also, that's assuming that internet access is a given, uh, which it is still not, unfortunately, in many parts of the world. Today, I'm delighted to have with me three great panelists who will discuss some of these questions as it has impacted various countries in Asia and beyond. I will be introducing each of them in the course of the webinar, and they will each speak for about 10 minutes. This will be followed by a panel discussion, and then there will be a chance for them to respond to the questions coming from you. Before we begin, I thought we would make this session as interactive as possible, so we thought we would do an audience poll now. The question is, is e-learning the magic solution for higher education during the COVID-19 pandemic, yes or no? Uh, please take a moment to click your response to the question and we will share with you the poll results at about half time. I would now like to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Wesley Tita is a senior consultant for higher education at UNESCO's Asia and Pacific Regional Bureau for Education in Bangkok, Thailand. His research and consulting projects focus on building state capabilities to ensure equitable access to quality higher education for all. He is a co-editor of the Handbook for Education Policy, which is forthcoming, and he is co-editor of UNESCO's guidelines on developing and implementing qualification frameworks in Asia Pacific. He will now be speaking on the work of UNESCO in monitoring the impact of COVID-19 on people and places for relevant higher education. So Wesley, over to you. Thank you very much, Sawatikap. Warm greetings from Bangkok. Thank you very much. It's really a great pleasure to be here with you, everyone in the audience and the Head Foundation, our strong friends and partners who are curating this really important and timely discussion. Um, warm greetings also from my co-author, um, co Dr. Lading Wong. He's our chief of section uh, here at UNESCO Bangkok. We sincerely hope you're safe and well. Uh, I think that's first and foremost to start and recognize that you're all dealing with uh, very serious uh, circumstances and ourselves included. So I do hope you're safe and well. So what we're talking about today is the impact of COVID-19, particularly on people and places, and most of all, your sense of purpose. I think that's one of the main messages is how your sense of purpose has been transformed. 
So given the far reaching implications of this pandemic, how has your sense of purpose been impacted? And I just wanna read you a few quotes and highlights as we start to think about this discussion and get rolling with the cases that we have in front of us for today's session. So I'm gonna read you the first quote. Never before have we witnessed educational disruption on such a scale. That's from the Director General of UNESCO. You can go back to the first slide, no problem. Um, so I don't want us to be blindly optimistic because what we're thinking about is 1 billion learners that have been affected as of today. I think it's important to think about the magnitude of the challenges that we face so that we're not optimistic for no reason. We have to be active, open-minded and challenging the paradigms that are in front of us. And as such, that's UNESCO's key role, contributing to evidence-based policies in higher education. It's critical that we think about UNESCO's role and your role as promoting equitable access for all, and including in the context of the Sustainable Development Agenda, Sustainable Development Goal 4. So what I wanna to do today is kind of walk you through a few quick points in just five or six minutes and end with three action principles, which I think can guide our response. And I, and I wanna hear what's relevant for you as well. So please contribute in the chat session. Um, first, the bad news. COVID-19, with its tremendous losses of life, has also triggered one of the deepest global recessions in decades. This is direct from the World Bank a few days ago. We are in a crisis, uh, resulting in contractions across the vast majority of emerging markets, and especially developing economies. We think it will do lasting damage uh, to labor productivity and potential outputs. These are real issues that we have to deal with uh, first and foremost, and I think there is a strong role and case to make for higher education. Um, I know that we're focused on Southeast Asia, but the, the, the beginning of our article was to call attention that Southeast Asia is not alone in this world. You have so many strengths, so many assets that you can contribute to the wider region and the world. So I wanted to read this short quote, if I could, that's the start of our article. And this comes from my friends and colleagues in Herat, Afghanistan. So here's the quote. I don't have a contract to receive my monthly salary. My salary depends on the daily teaching of classes. And now the schools are locked down and I'm jobless. I have no provision to support my poor family. These are real circumstances, um, even just a few minutes ago, I was talking with my friends and colleagues in Herat. We know that ASEAN has a lot of rich experience in, in, in providing an inclusive approach, uh, approach and including in place, countries like Thailand, where we have, mm, I think about 160, 164,000 non-Thai students. So thinking about the non-Thai students that are based in these local systems, how are we protecting? How are we engaging? How are we even keeping track in terms of the evidence of how we're providing support? And we know that regardless of the education level, uh, that there is a danger that learning inequalities can be expanded. And that's this quote that you see here, that certainly higher education is not exempt. In the context of higher education, how can we revisit our purpose? So this is another very short quote that just, I think is very important and timely for us to continue to reflect on. Who is not being served and why? This is from Professor Reimers, but it's several years ago and you think that this is one of these timeless questions that we're always, we're always struggling with equitable access to quality education. And I think this is important for us to reflect on in terms of the sustainable development agenda, which is truly relevant at this moment to ensure equitable access to quality education for all. How do we measure that? How do we understand that when so many are not able to access online courses or if they are able to access it, how are they not able to uh, experience the, the human connection and, and mentoring that they need? I think this is really critical to think about not only access, but quality issues. So in the next slide, this is just wrapping up, thinking about three action principles, doing good by all. And I think this is, for me, the main takeaways from our article. Number one, and let me know if this resonates with you, focus on building a holistic and inclusive ecosystem for online and blended learning. We need to make sure that we have these reserves, that we have this capacity to provide an inclusive environment regardless of the challenges we face in higher education going forward. Um, that involves quality assurance, that involves different types and different forms of, 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 of formal learning, non-formal learning, for example. Number two, this may not seem obvious to a lot of people, but we need to be thinking about how we promote fair and transparent recognition of diverse qualifications. It may not be the first response that we come to, but essentially this is part of the transformation of higher education to a learning outcomes based system. How do we recognize those different types of learning pathways? Um, we need to deal with this in a fair and transparent way. To date, 
No country in Southeast Asia has ratified the Tokyo Convention on Recognition. This is a, a fundamental legally binding instrument that puts students first to make sure that learners and their qualifications have a chance to present what they know and get it assessed in a fair and transparent way. If it's not equal, then the system providers have to explain why it's not recognized as equal. I think this legal foundation is important for us to advocate for in Southeast Asia and again throughout the wider region. Number three, and for me, this is one of my main highlights, uh, to ensure that higher education, teaching, research, and service are relevant to local needs. In the context of the challenges we face, for me, three words really jump to mind. Place-based relevance. I think we need to think deeply about our mission, our local service to community, how teaching is reaching those most in need, how research is providing answers to the questions we desperately need. And as I wrap up, I just wanna read some concluding remarks from the International Commission on the Future of Education. Here's a quote for you. COVID-19 presents us with a real challenge and a real responsibility. These ideas invite debate, engagement, and action by governments, international organizations such as UNESCO, civil society, educational professionals, as well as learners and stakeholders at all levels. So going forward, we need unity, solidarity, and new forms of collaboration to protect and promote education as a global public good, one that every society depends on to end poverty, combat inequality, and shape a sustainable future. Thank you very much again for your time. I look forward to our discussion. Korkun Kup. Thanks, thanks very much, Wesley. Um, I can't think of a better person or better organization to give us that regional overview and with that the insights of what we do need to address um, quite urgently I think in higher education today with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, moving on now to the Philippines, um, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Professor Nemia Simbulan who is Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at the University of the Philippines, Manila where she is also professor at the Department of Behavioral Sciences, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the College of Public Health. Uh, Nimia is also executive director of the Philippine Human Rights Information Center, or Phil Rights, a human rights education and information center engaged in advocacy work on economic, social, and cultural rights in the Philippines. Uh, Nimia will be speaking about rising above the challenges of COVID-19 with examples from the Philippines. So, Nimia, over to you. Thank you, oh, oh, Yung. Uh, blessed day to everyone, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to share the experiences and challenges faced by higher education institutions in the Philippines in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed the world due to the nature of the virus, particularly how it is transmitted. It has altered human behaviors, relations, and lifestyles, and had profound impacts on the economic, political, and cultural landscapes of societies across the world. It has likewise exacerbated poverty, discrimination, and inequalities in many parts of the world not only through how COVID-19 appears to be affecting poorer communities more than the rich, but also as a consequence of the measures taken by states to control the spread of the virus, primarily by curtailing freedom of movement through the imposition of community quarantine, lockdowns and curfews in many parts, in many parts of the world. COVID-19 has created opportunity, on, on the other hand, COVID-19 has created opportunities and challenges to higher education institutions in the Philippines. But the pandemic has transform, transformed universities, laboratories, clinics, offices, and even homes into centers of discovery and innovation, creativity and resourcefulness, as evidenced by the activities undertaken and products produced by universities in response to the public health crisis. In the context of the imposition of a community quarantine or lockdown, resulting to a stay at home, work from home policy, practice of physical distancing and prohibition on mass gatherings in the Philippines, even the setting up of checkpoints. 
higher education institutions instituted changes to curb the spread of the virus, protect the health and safety of individuals, especially frontline workers, and adapt to the new normal. There were also challenges to continue the discharge of fundamental functions of teaching, research, and public service. In the area of teaching, from the confines of their homes, teachers and administrators were put to task of revising and adopting course syllabi and requirements as they shifted to alternative or remote teaching modalities, both synchronous and asynchronous. So uh, in the country, because of the uh, emergency situation of the, or the abnormal situation, that was among the first tasks that uh, have been uh, take, uh, that have been assumed by universities and colleges. There was a re review and revision of course syllabi, uh, including modes of delivery, requirements, and methods of assessment. There was also the shift to remote, that would be online and offline learning modalities, both synchronous and asynchronous. There was also the task of being able to establish contact and communication with students, finding out how they were and how they were, they were cop coping in the, in the light of the pandemic. Among the challenges faced by uh, universities was ensuring equitable access to devices and internet connectivity in the context of the shift to remote learning modalities. This would be a very concrete problem primarily for students who, uh, who uh, went to the provinces to be with their families and loved ones. Also, there were changes in policies, for, in for instance, adoption of a letter grading system, the policy of uh, no student is to be given a failing mark and given, given time to complete course requirements, uh, lifting of the deadline in the filing of uh, leave of absence, etc. In the area of research and public service, this researchers, scientists, and practitioners in the health, social, and behavioral sciences, engineering, arts, and humanities intensified their collaboration and partnership to generate knowledge needed to produce timely and relevant um, policies and programs, projections, strategies, products, and inventions. Laboratories, clinics, offices, workplaces, and even homes were transformed into spaces of discovery and innovation, creativity and resourcefulness, giving credence to the saying, necessity is the mother of change and innovation. Also, because of the abnormal situation, universities were involved in enhancing capabilities and competencies of members of the academe, professional groups, and the general public by sharing their knowledge, skills, and expertise on relevant topics. There were training activities, mentoring sessions, and webinars were organized by various colleges and universities using Zoom and Skype. And topics covered among this include uh, online teaching, biosafety, COVID-19, and emerging infectious diseases, and psychosocial first aid, and support to students and faculty. Students, teachers, and staff, and alumni initiated various projects and activities to solicit and extend support and resources to ensure the safety of healthcare workers, food producers, and distributors, grocery and supermarket workers, and law enforcement agents manning checkpoints. On the part of civil society groups and non-government organizations, which also did an important role under the current public health crisis, many of them served as watchdogs or critics of government's COVID-19 related policies, programs, plans, etc. 
They also provided services to impoverished communities. Uh, among these services would be paralegal aid in the case of uh, lawyers, uh, faculty members teaching in law, law, law schools, uh, law students. Uh, there were also organizations which did documentation of human rights violations, especially since the Philippines has been named as one of the countries under the pandemic which have resorted to harsh and relatively violent strategies in ensuring that certain policies and courses of action were carried out to the letter. Also, there were counseling to victims of domestic violence. Let me end by this statement. The pandemic has clearly demonstrated the social, economic, and political environmental realities and phenomena from varying perspectives and the unsustainable conditions that many of us have been living with. It has also produced new problems and challenges and changed the way we live our lives. Universities also need to review and evaluate the research agenda and priorities to respond to these realizations and changes. The COVID-19 pandemic has produced a new world full of challenges, dilemmas, as well as opportunities. It is up to us to adopt and transform the challenges and dilemmas to opportunities for growth and development for our nation and the global community. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nimia Simbulan, um, who is Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at the University of the Philippines, Manila. Um, a perspective there from a university leader in the Philippines, um, especially given the lockdown in the city of Manila, which, was, um, which happened quite early on in the crisis. Um, uh, do keep your questions for the panelists uh, coming in um, as we now turn to our last but very means not the least speaker, uh, Dr. Tang Pham. Um, Dr. Tang Pham is Senior Lecturer in Graduate Employability, Globalization and Intercultural Education at the Faculty of Education, Monash University, Australia. Her research interests are in graduate employability, intercultural education, and the internationalization of education. She has been conducting substantial research on the internationalization on higher education curricula and enhancing interactions of students from various backgrounds and contexts, um, something very relevant here, I'm sure. Uh, she'll be speaking on what is a very fascinating topic on how the COVID-19 situation is enabling the recognition of non-Western pedagogies. So Tan, it's over to you. Yeah. Um, good evening to everybody. It's globally. Yes, it is evening in Melbourne. Um, thanks so much, uh, Head Foundation, for this very unique opportunity to uh, you know, share my research about uh, how COVID-19 is creating uh, an opportunities for us to internationalize our education. So um, the first two speakers already give us a, a picture about how you know, COVID-19 is creating uh, challenges, but then how UNESCO governments and universities are working on different initiatives to manage the situation. So to continue the, the seminar, I will go into the third level, that is the micro level. So I will discuss how COVID-19 is creating an opportunities for us to kind of like, you know, internationalize education and internationalize our pedagogies. That's something very fascinating because we have talked about internationalization of our education, especially in Western countries for many years. But then we do not really kind of like really think to what we have done and what we have not done. So my argument uh, in the presentation, the main argument is that, so for when COVID-19 happened, actually we are having good opportunity for non-Western pedagogies to be recognized and to be embedded in Western pedagogies and curriculum. And for Western education, yes, my argument is that COVID-19 is actually creating a very, very unique opportunity for we to truly internationalize our education, pedagogies and curriculum. 
So before I talk about how to, uh, internationalization truly, to, you know, how we truly internationalize our pedagogies and cu curriculums that happened during and after COVID-19, I just would like to, to you know, to, um, give you uh, some backgrounds about international students, how international students have studied overseas and how they have been treated in the host countries. And when I say host countries here, so we, I mainly refer to Western countries. So now here's the latest um, statistics I got from the special issues we just published. Now, the, um, until 2017, uh, in total, so we have 5.3 five, uh, 5 million international students who have done their studies overseas or are doing their studies overseas. And about two thirds of these numbers are uh, you know, so from non-Western non -Western countries to Western countries. And you know, so the main countries they go to and they have chose to study, so you already know, so, yeah, so most of us you know, you know, so already familiar so with the international context. So the main countries international students chose for their studies at the you know, so United States, uh, United Kingdom, uh, Canada, and Australia. And recently Japan you know, so it becomes a very popular, so very kind of like favorite place for international students. And we know 56% um, of international students are Asians. So the, the main countries who send students to Western countries, we already know, China, you know are those countries like China, Vietnam, India, and recently it's Nepal. So the, um, when international students come to Western countries, yes, and uh, uh, mainly I talk about non-Westerns and Western countries. So here's when I talk about international students, I mainly refers to Asian students. So when the, um, Asian students or international students go to host countries, what they bring to them? They bring to them two types of values. The first one I call tangible values, and the second one is intangible values. So tangible values usually include those things, for example, like you know, the type of food they eat, the type of clothes they wear, and you know, the type of festivals they celebrate. So to some um, you know, so great extent, Western countries, they, they already well recognize those kind of like tangible values. And they already celebrate, you know, so they talk a lot about like cultural diversity, and they tend to focus on kind of like internationalized or diversified those tangible values. And we see a lot of events, a lot of activities that you know, some, a lot of schools and universities in Western countries have done to celebrate kind of like cultural diversity. And again, cultural diversity is years, they tend to only focus on tangible values, celebrate like different types of food that students in the school or university, celebrate different types of festivals, you know, so we are having. And the second type of values that international students bring with them, to, we, we call intangible values. And intangible values here so refers, usually refer to kind of like our personal qualities. So personal qualities of international students, or, you know, so when they come to like Western countries, or usually to refer to those kinds of things like you know so their hard working, their persistence, and their resilience. So that they have you know so other type of personal qualities. But here are some of the main qualities we usually talk about Asian students. So. In teaching and learning, you know, so when we talk about intangible values of the international students, we tend to, you know, to talk about intellectual heritages. So intellectual heritage it here refers to kind of like, you know, so the, the way they learn, the practices they use, you know, to, you know, for their learning, and you know, so the kind of like concepts, the type of ideologies they bring with them. Uh, unfortunately, it's if you look into what we have done and what we are doing at Western universities, we do not really recognize those intangible values yet. So the, an example is if you look into the way the Western education, you know, Western classrooms are doing, they tend to focus on kind of like, you know, Western-based pedagogies, Western-based ideologies. So in teachings, we have talked a lot about those things like Vygotsky, you know, so BRJs, talk a lot about, you know, so how the learning would happen and we praise and we favor those kinds of like verbal discussion, verbal interaction and teamwork and, you know, problem-based learnings and inquiry learning. In Asians, we do have those kinds of pedagogies, but, you know, so the more common pedagogies in Asian classrooms, we tend to talk about kind of like, you know, 
of a high level of scaffolding or the kind of like explicit learning. And if you apply those activities, those practices in Western countries, we, you know, so we are kind of like not appreciated and we are not respected by Western educations and Western pedagogies. So the consequence is in the Western classrooms, Asian students, or those we have massive number of international students, like at Monas, we have like 40%, you know, almost 40% of international students. And in one class, you know, it depends on different type of, you know, faculties. But, you know, on average, we have like almost 40, you know, 40 percent of students in class. But then international students are seen as in inferior others. That means, you know, they are the students who need to learn from other students and other students yes you know so it actually you know so western students and international students we say yes we acknowledge you know so they have identities they have their own culture but then they still need to assimilate in western academic conventions that means we need they need to learn you know so what is from westerns you know western ideologies western theories western practices so now, you know, so look at what is happening after, you know, during and after COVID-19, perhaps later. You know, so my argument is that, you know, so COVID-19 and online learning actually create a very unique opportunities for non-Western pedagogies and non-Western ideologies and concepts to be recognized and to be recognized to be recognized and to be embedded in Western curriculum and how this would happen. So now, how did what happen? Um, I would like to invite you to look at, um, you know, something very interesting. And actually, I only realized, you know, so the connections between the pedagogies and what I call determinants and benefits. When I taught online teaching at Monas for the last whole semester intensively. So after I was engaged in teaching online um, at Monas, you know, so like really deeply because, you, you know, online learning, you know, so was the only thing to you, uh, uh, everywhere as universities and schools have to you for the last six months. So um, what, what I observed, you know, so I found, uh, you know, so, uh, the, the correlations between pedagogies, determinants and, you know, pe um, benefits of energies, uh, something like this. So look at, you know, so how online teaching and learning are happening. So the, on the left hand side, yes, we have the student conditions and then to the left, the, uh, the, the, the right hand side, we have online pedagogies. So um, look at the, you know, so the left hand side, we need, <clears throat> all of us need to agree in the virtual space when online and teaching, online, online teaching and learning happen, students have very little interaction. Yes, we all need to agree this. So when the students uh, you know, so do not have much space to verbally discuss or to interact with their peers your, or to, you know, so with their uh, tutors and lecturers, they need to be engaged with what we call cognitions or silence uh, pedagogies. Because uh, you know, uh, when they cannot discuss verbally and work in, 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 in teams or you know, so with other people, they need to, to, to be independent and engage in you know, a new type of thinking, use you know, quiet things thinking to produce learning. Now, you know, so Vygotsky, you know, usually if you are in education, so we all know, Vygotsky said, you know, so verbal discussion and verbal interactions lead to learning. If the, we, the, we are quietly learning, so learning can happen, but not at, you know, so the op optimal level. So now, you know, so the pedagogies we are using for online uh, teaching and learning are actually challenging the fundamental principles of Vygotsky um, education uh, uh, pedagogies. And if you, you, you are in education, you all know that Vygotskyan, uh, Vygotskyan you know, principle of pedagogies are the popular and kind of like the fundamental principle for teaching and learning in Western classrooms and Western education. Now look at the second point. So when students are engaged, you know, in online teaching and learning, yes, uh, look at what is happening during COVID-19. And I think so like um, for some times after COVID-19, students are, you know, suffering, you know, so, uh, very high levels of studying load. And uh, during COVID-19, because they do not have enough support from teachers and from their peers, they need to have a high level of, you know, like instructions. They require a high level of instructions from teachers and, you know, a high level of explicit teachings from the teachers. 
So the, if the, we let them to kind of like navigate learning by themselves, yes, to some extent they can navigate the systems, but then I'm sure a high number of students will easily get lost. So how to support, you know, the majority of students and help the major, majority of students to navigate the problems we are having, we are facing. Yes, we have to agree that, you know, our pedagogies, you know, the way to we instruct, the way to we help our students need to be clearer. We need to help them to put more explicitly, but not kind of like let them to do things or do we apply what we call it problem-based learning or inquiry learning. I do not really think, you know, those kind of pedagogies are effective in the context of COVID-19. So now so let's look at the last one. High to, you know, students are facing a high level of anxieties and stress and uncertainty. So within this context, you know, so we all know, you know, students are suffer a lot of things like we are doing. So how to help them to cope with all of these problems, we need to really think about the type, the type of pedagogies that do not only teach them, but we need to show caring, understanding and empathy. So, to, you know, so if you look at all the features on the left hand, on the right hand side, the type of the pedagogy is there. Actually, actually they are the common the principles of non-Western pedagogies. So now, so oh look, you know, so what is happening now? To we, uh, you know, a, signif a significant message we we are seeing. You know, so how do we can help students? How we can apply, you know, so pedagogy effectively to help our students, you know, to learn now and later? So we really need to think about, you know, so the correlations between determinants, pedagogies, and benefits. Now, so when we talk about pedagogies, you know, so, um, or, or when the things, uh, you know, so were normal and, you know, so the problems we are facing now didn't happen, we tend to only think about benefits of pedagogies. For example, so when we talk about kind of like inquiry learning, problem-based learning, we, we tend to talk about what kind of benefits students can get from, you know, those kind of pedagogies. And we tend to say so what students would not get if they are engaged in like explicit teaching or high stuff folding student but then you know so look at what we are doing and what we you know our students are facing i think it's more important for us before we talk about benefits we really need to think about the context of the pedagogy you know so what kind of context you know the pedagogies can happen and what are the conditions for pedagogies to happen rather than talking about benefits so now that you may have a question. So you know, so what, so how qualities of teaching and learning would look like if we change our pedagogies, move, moving away, you know, from like Western-based pedagogies to kind of like non-Western pedagogies. So that I can guarantee and I can demonstrate, you know, for having uh, you know the evidence to show when do we take your know, determinants of pedagogies into considerations and more modify our uh, pedagogy high quality teaching and learning still happen. And to hear what happened in one unit I taught at Monas the last semester. So you can see, you know, so what students share with us, you know, about how do we apply our pedagogies. The email that students really appreciate, you know, like high scaffolding and well-structured pedagogies we applied in the unit. And very fascinating, uh, very late last night, I got a table of the results from one tutorial uh, from the unit. And uh, here is the result of 30 students. And you can see it's the result, the number of students receiving um, uh, 70 to 100 and compared um, from 2019 and 2020, we see the numbers increase and the number of students receive 50 to 70, whether we cost credit and, um, uh, and, and, uh, and pass the decrease. So, you know, so it's very clearly, you know, so we have, you know, both quality and quantity to demonstrate, you know, so the type of pedagogy is modified and it will perfectly fit in the context of online teaching and learning. And it, uh, we also ensure the quality of teaching and learning. Yeah, so now so the conclusions, you know, we learn from here is that, Yes, COVID-19 is, you know, something nobody wants, but then when it happens, we need to think, you know, so it's not, a, you know, a kind of like a, a disaster, but we, we need to really think about, you know, so it is an opportunity for us to, you know, to challenge, you know, so, you know, how we change what we are doing and perhaps, you know, something better would happen. So yeah, let's hope, you know, um, what would uh, happen better in, you know, so during and after COVID-19. Yeah, thank you. Hi, thank you very much, Tang.
Um, that's um, a very good presentation. It, it, it really um, forces us to look at the silver lining behind this crisis. Uh, and she has also um, forced us to rethink the fundamental assumptions of what higher education pedagogy is about and um, how the delivery of teaching can take place. Uh, so thank you very much, Tang, for that. Uh, we're now sort of at half time. I see many good questions coming in in the Q&A. Uh, we will definitely do our best to address them, if anything, in clusters, if you do not mind. Um, but before that, uh, as promised, we're now going to share with you the results of the first poll question at the start of the webinar. And if you could see the results now on the screen, please. Um, is e-learning the magic solution for higher education during the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, it seems that the yes vote is edging out the no vote. Um, seems like it is still very much needed, um, even despite the cons of um, the online um, remedies, if it will. So thank you very much for that. We will now have the second question. Uh, I think it might be more uh, uh, pressing in some ways for university leaders. And the second question is this. As a precaution, should the upcoming university semester, sort of running from July to the end of this year, should it be held completely online? Um, given obviously the public health concerns or that, but also the cons of having um, education completely online where, where some parts of the world, you do not even have internet access uh, or stable internet access, uh, yes or no. So I'll just leave that up for a few more moments for you to make your response. I will share uh, the results at the end of this webinar. So thank you very much. If I could now pose a question, the same question to panelists, uh, starting with uh, Wesley, um, do you think the next semester should be completely online? Good question. Um, well, UNESCO deals with 46 member states in the Asia Pacific region, so you have the range of experiences. I just want to read some quick data from Japan, which I think is interesting. 87%, um, uh, maybe 930 out of 1,070 universities and colleges in Japan could not start their new semester at the beginning of April. So when you think about East Asia, some of us might think that you know, these issues have been addressed. Um, but we, we found in the case of Japan, almost none of the new international students in spring could come to Japan. So international student mobility has been quite impacted. Uh, many cancellations were postponed, occurred in various kinds of student exchanges, mobility programs. Uh, there was a lot of impacts that need to be addressed before we can just say one way or the other, open up. So I think it's a big depends on the, the capability of the system. Uh, so I think there's no universal answer for that, at least in the context of Asia and the Pacific. Thanks, Wesley. Um, Nimia, Professor Nimia, um, I was wondering what, what plans do your university have um, for the next semester, given all this, this situation? Yes, uh, I think uh, for many of the universities in the Philippines, particularly the University of the Philippines, Manila, I would say that courses would predominantly be online or mm. via remote uh, learning. Uh, but there will be definitely there will be certain courses where face to face is something that is uh, non negotiable. And this is particularly in the case of courses like medicine and the health sciences professions. So, in the university where I teach, which is the health sciences center of the University of the Philippines system, we are open to the possibility that there may be courses that will require face-to-face, -face, no matter how limited this may be, provided that the conditions would allow. For instance, uh, and certain requirements are satisfied. For instance, um, physical distancing, wearing of protective devices, both for students, patients, and the faculty members. Uh, uh, prohibition on uh, mass gatherings. In other words, there would be very limited. No? So unlike before, where you, have, you may have uh, 20 to 30 students in a classroom uh, under the current condition will not be uh, allowed. So I think uh, um, that will, I mean, it, it will, the, the conditions of uh, primarily online uh, will, will uh, depend on the nature of the courses. And as I've said, there are definitely some courses where you cannot avoid dealing with the uh, dealing or uh, relating to patients. For instance, dentistry. There are certain, uh, uh, particularly when they go into clinics, uh, you cannot, uh, uh, although there, there may be applications where simulation can be done, uh, there are certain courses in the university where you still have to deal with patients uh, uh, 
uh, in the in the clinics. Thank you very much, Nimia. Uh, moving to Tang, um, what are you seeing as the situation in Australia where um, you are currently based? What, what's the situation there regarding next semester? Mm -hmm. um, I think um, uh, to answer so at the system levels, Nimia's and Wesley's will be a better person because I am ordinary person. <laughs> I am just an academic, so not like at the system. But based on what I am seeing, I have an FMONAS is that um, next semester we are having planned to choose, um, we will choose some units, some courses to go online and some courses to do face to face. And what we will do for online is the areas that we have more international students. So like at Monas, we have like masters of education, 80 or 90 percent are international students. So we will do those uh, unit and courses online. And those courses with more local students like masters of teaching on uh, undergraduates, we will do face to face. And I heard we will do kind of like um, both blended like face to face and online. So like one week online and one week face to face. Yeah, so that is in the scope of Monas. Other universities, yeah, to be honest, are not really very clear. So I better not answer. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. So I, I think um, the conclusion roughly is that uh, it's a sort of a blended solution as we try to ease ourselves out of the lockdowns, uh, bearing in mind the public health uh, uh, importance. Yeah. Um, great. Oh, may I add uh, one more thing yes, regarding the issue of online. Another strategy which the university, and I think maybe some uni uh, many universities in the Philippines are uh, contemplating on, is redesigning or restructuring degree programs mm -hmm. and course offerings. So for instance, if it's really, an, uh, if you really uh, cannot avoid face-to-face, -face uh, no matter how limited this may be, there, there are faculty members are given the option to uh, delay the offering of these courses until conditions would allow. So you mm -hmm. you uh, offer courses, for instance, lecture courses that uh, will be that will that will not encounter problems uh, when they these are offered via remote or blended mode. So you instead of offering them, for instance, clinics and. Uh, uh, laboratories, instead of offering them during the first semester, they may be postponed to the second semester. So that would mm -hmm. that is actually another strategy which we are uh, considering. Mm. Yes, thank you very much for addressing that, Nimia, because that was also one one of those questions that we got in our Q and A um, regarding the, um, the solutions for courses that require laboratory work. But if I may, just still on you, um, Nimia, ask you uh, one follow-up question. Um, since you are a university leader in the Philippines, do you sort of have to grapple with a situation where you have to prioritize one course or the other or one uh, discipline over the other because of uh, limited resources as everyone around the world have at this stage? Um, so obviously medical sort of faculties are sort of the most essential perhaps at this time, but how about the other faculties like maybe engineering or other or maybe in the arts, for example, that still require that face-to-face. -face. Um, is, is there, it must be a very difficult situation to have to decide between these faculties. What, what do you see? Uh, in the case of uh, the University of the Philippines, I don't think there is such a problem because uh, we, there is a recognition that each of these degree programs and the course offerings of each of these de degree programs have, uh, I mean, are, are important important in uh, not only addressing uh, the challenges and needs of the times, but also in terms of future, responding to future challenges. So uh, the treatment of the different uh, degree programs, whether this be engineering or uh, in the health sciences or social sciences, arts and humanities are given equal importance. And there, uh, the, the problems and challenges that they face are being uh, handled and addressed to by uh, uh, administrators and university leaders. Thank you, Nimia. Uh, I'd like to just move back to a sort of a more regional um, outlook. So moving back to you, Wesley. Um, so there's some 1.2 billion students and youths across the planet that are affected by all these closures, obviously, because of COVID-19. Uh, and in response, the um, I understand that the Global Education Coalition, launched by UNESCO, 
seeks to engage a range of stakeholders worldwide. So the question is, uh, how can countries and higher education institutes in Southeast Asia get involved in these initi initiatives? Yeah, thank you very much. I think it's a really important question because sometimes we think of the Global Education Coalition, the, this formulation of, of big corporations, Microsoft, Apple, the big players that get their voices heard first. Um, but what I'm missing personally being based here in Bangkok is the strength and voices of governments and stakeholders in Southeast Asia. So I think going forward, we, know we just need to think about ASEAN in this internal sense, but in this global outreach uh, that is, I think, increasingly possible. Um, not to keep mentioning one country, but I, I work very closely with Malaysia in the context of its quality assurance system and how that can benefit, for example, developing countries like Afghanistan. So the idea is that ASEAN has very rich experiences. The, the countries around the region are not necessarily seen as a, as, a, as a partner in all of this sharing. So they often, I think, receive, but I, I don't think that's the case. I think this rich experience coming from ASEAN needs to be projected out. And I think that's what we need to be, and that's what we're doing here today, and that's what the Head Foundation is so strong at, is amplifying the voices of stakeholders in the region. And frankly, I want to see more of that so that there's leadership about uh, curriculum development, innovative responses uh, that work for us in this very large region. Um, and still on you, um, Wesley, um, some questions from the floor um, around this point. Um, um, as to what are the post-COVID scenarios that um, UNESCO is looking to address, um, have, have you guys started to think how you might address that? Obviously a big question for a lot of governments because a lot of unknowns, sure, will we sure. get a vaccine? Um, can we reopen safely? Will there be a second wave? Many questions, uh, but what are some of the initial plans or thoughts or, or scenario planning that you guys um, are looking at? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I saw that in the comments, so thank you for raising it. And, and I hope everyone understands that my, my comments are these action principle level because of the diversity of the region. It's very difficult for us to say that this is the correct path one way or the other. Um, but increasingly what we're seeing is that this is very likely to be a blended approach. Uh, one of the action principles is saying, we have to, we have to give choice to students. Um, we have to recognize that we don't have all the answers right now. Um, that this is going to be an evolving system. Um, we have to be able to proactively respond to those individual needs and circumstances, including their ability to pay. Um, so a lot of these questions have been impacted and I, I, I think are only going to be clear in the, in the course of the next few months. So what we need to be looking for in terms of our scenarios is how do we provide this quality assured ecosystem for blended learning? Uh, at least in traditional higher education. Right now, our quality assurance systems are not necessarily well adapted to deal with online learning at this scale. Uh, usually it's a supplementary or a smaller percentage of learning credits, but it's, it's certainly not to 100% of online learning. So going forward, a large scenario plan needs to be developed around uh, the role of blended learning and our institutional capacity to manage blended learning in, a, in an inclusive way. So if you look on our website, you'll see a blended learning self-assessment tool. So institutions can go there and think about the strategic dimensions of blended learning and, and give themselves a score. And what evidence do they have for those different scores that they give themselves and kind of peer review themselves and as they think about getting ready for the coming semester. Yeah. Thanks, Jeffy. Um, I think the, the work of organizations like um, UNESCO is very important. Um, all this intergovernmental coordination work, um, especially even just not talking about the COVID-19 situation, the geopolitical situation around the world. Obviously, that's a whole webinar for mm. itself. Uh, we wouldn't uh, be touching on sure. that today, but um, mm. really appreciate the kind of work that UNESCO uh, and people like Wesley are doing at this uh, very difficult time. Now, if I may mm. turn to... Thank you. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, there's some questions for you specifically, uh, including from Caroline Wong. Uh, two questions in my post to you, Nimia. Uh, the first is, there's a lot of debate as to how prepared the Department of Education in the Philippines is about shifting to online and internet learning collectively. The students in the provinces uh, fear that they're left behind due to poor internet connection. So what is your view on that? And what's the government's take on that? One more question too, if I may just um, put it a cluster to you, uh, Professor Nimia. The other question regards the situation in the Philippines. Let me just um, put it out for you. Um, is democracy failing its sense of purpose in the Philippines, taking into account the current events happening in Manila? Um, the examples are given here in the question of uh, the lawmakers' strong support to the anti-terror bill that can lead to human rights violations, the verdict to reckless CEO being guilty of libel. So some, some other 
um, uh, human rights issues, press freedom, uh, information, and that sort of relates to also the debate on um, disinformation campaign, so-called the fake news campaign uh, uh, phenomenon, which I think higher education is somewhat linked to. Um, what else can higher education, uh, Professor Nimia, what else can higher education do for democratic ideals or principles um, to work um, in the Philippines? Over to you. Okay. Uh, with respect to the first question in terms of the preparedness of the Department of Education in addressing the educational needs and promoting the rights of students, definitely, uh, in fairness to the D Department of Education, there is a recognition on their part that uh, no one should be left behind. No, no student or pupil should be left behind, especially those belonging to uh, the poor and marginalized sections of uh, Philippine society. However, there are certain challenges. And uh, right now, uh, I am not that optimistic in terms of uh, the preparations and the uh, courses of action being taken by uh, the Department of Education to be able to uh, uh, address these challenges. So, of course, one would be readiness of teachers, pupils, as well as parents you know, in the shift to remote and blended learning, especially uh, since the education will take place in the homes. You know? And mm. in many of the uh, uh, households, the priority is definitely survival. You know? it, it, uh, as, uh, because of the problems of unemployment, loss of income, loss of jobs, uh, which many of our people have experienced mm. because of the pandemic. So in terms of priority and the attention, definitely the attention of both parents and pupils will be divided because priority is going to be given to uh, being able to earn an income, being able to provide food on the table to members of the family. So definitely in terms of the readiness of students to be able to concentrate with, uh, with assignments, with uh, uh, schoolwork, that would be divided. No? So th there is a question regarding the mental health uh, preparedness of uh, students as well as parents who will be, because under the, the shift of, or in the shift to the remote learning, the, prior, the responsibility is also shifted to the parents no? since that education takes place uh, in the home. No? Of, another would be materials. Materials, materials uh, that will guide the pupils, students in their day-to-day -day, uh, uh, learning activities. There is a plan of the DepEd that these materials or modules that they are currently preparing will be distributed to pupils or students in the homes. But I greatly doubt that because in the past, even materials that were produced under a uh, non-remote mode of learning were, uh, were rotting in uh, uh, warehouses of the Department of uh, Education. They were not being distributed to students, so we had problems regarding ratio of students to learning materials. No? Then, of course, the issue of access to devices and internet connectivity. It is mm -hmm. a known fact that in many parts of the country, particularly in the provinces, there, are, there is no electricity. So how can you expect people, even if they, uh, uh, how can you expect uh, uh, households to have access to uh, uh, the internet uh, where many of these courses will be uh, uh, presented? And then of course, uh, mm -hmm. although there is an effort on the part of the state to uh, make use of mainstream media, radio and television, uh, unfortunately, one of the uh, television stations, which has the widest reach in the country, has just been shut down. That is ABS-CBN because of the problem of uh, uh, renewal of franchise. So uh, mm. even mm. access to radio and television would rather be very limited, especially in the provinces. So uh, what... what the bottom line is, I think we will have, uh, I, I, don't, I think there will really be problems of students or pupils being left behind. 
because of these numerous uh, uh, problems and challenges being faced by uh, the Department of Education. Thank you, Nimia. Um, I always oh. appreciate your, your perspective oh. on how um, you can consider how we can consider the on the ground issues as well as the top yeah. level sort of uh, governance issues and how how all these can be solved uh, uh, so that very basic rights such as the right to education um, and to sustenance um, can be met. So thank you very much, Nimia, for that. If I may now turn to Tang, um, I guess two two main issues. But first, a question from me. Um, what are some of the examples or specific examples of confusion or non-Western uh, pedagogical practices uh, that can be applied mm -hmm. to online teaching and learning? And and when, if and when this um, pandemic sort of um, closes uh, in, um, would this be sort of still sustain itself after this pandemic? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the questions. Um, uh, I think um, a lot of audience here has come from Asian countries. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about Confucians, yeah, Confucian education, our um, uh, ideologies in education. So now, so, um, first, I would like to make it very clear yes, about you know, so how do we interpret uh, you know, Confucians, pedagogies, or Confucians um, kind of like principle in education. Um, uh, and because Confucians are principles in education, uh, usually is kind of like tied to what we call like explicit teaching and learning. And when we talk about explicit teaching and learning, you know, so people tend to think about like, you know, uh, explicit teachings means we give answers to students' questions. You know, so it is not about, you know, so when we apply explicit teaching, it's not about, you know, so we, we give answers to, to students directly so without kind of like, you know, creating opportunities for them to think, you know, explicit. If we know how to use explicit teaching and confusion as a principle in education, we need to know about, you know, the, the, the purpose and, you know, the kind of like the, the meaning of, you know, the, um, uh, how, how we use those principles to guide the students. So the in um, you know the Confucians educations, well, well, for example, we, we have a lot of principles. But one principle that I have used a lot in my teachings, and I also share with many international students and Western students, we have the um, you know so one uh, kind of like philosophy which we call it knowledge points. So knowledge points here means you know so when we teach, when we design any lessons, we need to make sure that our students gain and understand some knowledge points before we move to some, uh, something else. So without you know, sort of knowing knowledge points, you know, we just make it simple like, you know, like, like main contents, main knowledge in each lesson. Well, so if do, uh, students do not gain those knowledge points, they cannot go to the next step. So in you know, so Western education, um, I'm, I'm not criticizing, but I'm just kind of like give example. We tend to kind of like um, overstate or kind of like put students to, uh, to be creative. I have to say like creative too much. So sometimes kind of like we skip the foundation. So we let students to do as much as they can. And you know, I, I agree, you know, some students they can do fantastically. They they, they can you know so they, they can you know jump from the ground to up to the sky immediately. But majority majority of students they need foundation before they can do something creatively. So the, the Confucian education, we you know we have the principle. So for example, in uh, in teachings, you know, so we have to guide students to understand the key points first before you know they can do something independently. So the, something simple like in teaching, if you know, I know some of the student audience here are my students. So the, if you, you you remember the last semester, so we did in the unit, we, we, we taught, you know, so we make it very clear, you know, so what are, you know, the learning outcomes of each lesson? What are the learn, le learning principles of the, the uh, lectures and how those things connected to the learning objectives of the tutorials? And in assessments, we make it very clear too, we build staff for students to kind of like develop knowledge, prepare them step by step before we go to the big chunk of assessment at the beginning, uh, at the end of the semester. So it's not about when we talk about explicit teaching, 
please don't automatically think about, you know, kind of like, you know, so we give answers to students' questions without asking them thinking. No, it's not about that. So the, um, uh, I say, you know, in online teaching and learning, we really need to think about explicit teaching in terms of what I just explained. Because as I just say, the context we are doing with our students, we do not have kind of like, you know, so, face-to-face -face discussions and we build a you know, kind of like well structured context for them. So all you know what we need to do is kind of like we create you know clear and instruction, clear instructions for them and so that we, they can navigate, you know, the kind of like the puzzle, you know, everybody is facing. So now come to the second question. So after COVID-19, you know, so how such kind of you know pedagogical principles, you know, could stay sustained or disappear. No, so I think it's very interesting because COVID-19 um, actually is creating opportunity for us to reflect on what we are doing. I hear, as I say, we, we include, you know, both Western and non-Western academics. And like in my presentations, I say, you know, the so internationalization education, we talk about it, you know, so in Western countries for many years, but we don't really kind of like reflect on what we have done well and what we have not done well. So now it's time for us when we engage with online teaching. And if, you know, so like you, you are serious about teaching and we are, you know, we really, you really think about, you know, so what are happening, what you have done well, what we ha you have not done well to, with the, uh, online teaching. I'm sure, that, you know, so we will pull out some principles for kind of like effective pedagogies. So if we now reflect on its free series list, we now to pull out some effective, you know, some principle for teaching. I believe after COVID-19, without online learning, when we come back to face-to-face, -to -face, those principles will stay. And, you know, it is the opportunity again, as I say, for confusion education and for non-Western pedagogies to be recognized and to be embedded in Western curriculums and teaching and learning. Thank you, Tang. Um, we have a couple of questions, a couple of questions around uh, balancing economic considerations with that of education and other um, health issues. Um, I would like to come to the other panelists on this, but first to thank again, because I know that's your research uh, interest, which is in graduate employability. We have two questions here, uh, one from Nagamal Supia, which is, um, how can we ensure equity of quality education when uh, the economic focus seems to be on the uh, seems to be the priority of countries and society, um, the current responses of many countries are clear evidence of this mindset. Right, the priority pri prioritization of economic considerations over um, others. Uh, also, a question from Helen Baum: Without jobs, education cannot contribute to feeding mouths and um, getting roofs overheads. Um, further education assumes good jobs, so this debate also requires addressing the design of jobs and corporate responsibilities. Tang, any thoughts on that? Oh, it's, it's very interesting questions. I will answer as much as I can. And Wesley and uh, Nimia can jump in because it's about you know, the economics and system. <laughs> yes, it's true. So I have done a lot of research about graduate employability. And it's very uh, interesting to when um, and very exciting debates about kind of like the roles of universities in terms of providing quality education um, or you know equipping students for jobs and employment. Uh, yes, of course, we always have different perspectives. And one perspective is saying that you know, so the roles of university is not to prepare students for jobs and employment, but to kind of like educate intellectually and you know. So like you know our education should be seen if like public goods but not commercial goods yeah so that is clearly is you know so many people are saying that but you know so on the other side we see to what are happening you know especially recently and i'm sure in many countries and clearly in australia we make it in and in this year 2020 you know so the, we have the policy you know so universities uh, uh, public funding government funding will be decided based on um, you know students employment rate so the higher the employment rate students have, the better the chance for universities to have funding. So the, we can see, you know, so, um, it's kind of like the puzzle, you know, so, uh, uh, from the academics point of view, so, like from my point of view, of course, you know, so I want to provide, you know, so a high quality education. So I want to inspire students, you know, so educational, <laughs> intellectually, and all the good things. But on the other side, you know, so the system, the government, you know, so we are, you know, they are putting a lot of pressures on us. 
So, you know, so in, um, uh, it, it comes to, the, you know, so how academics and universities need to kind of like combine both intellectuals and to kind of like commercial or vocational education. It is really like I have like a big question, but very excitedly, I think if we know how to combine those things, we can still do things. Uh, and, and, you know, so I can give you exactly the, uh, an example of the unit, the course I, um, I am teaching at Monas. It's about, you know, so the students' identities and uh, youth, um, you know, employment. So, to, uh, you know, so if you look at the title of the unit, it's about like, you know, so coming to this unit, you will learn about, you know, so employment, you will learn about employability, you will learn about something in the labor market. But, uh, you know, so, uh, the reality is not, you know, so in this unit, we still would have you know, a part talking about. So, yes, yes, uh, you, you, you know, after graduate, students need to find job. But then, you know, so we need to talk about, so what are the resources? What are the qualities students need to be equipped with? need to develop to be able to obtain their employment. So that is the space, you know, so for education. If we, we talk about employment or in, in, in intellectual, that is the space for academics and universities to combine, you know, and to, to equip our students, you know, so for their employment and for, you know, kind of like um, the real meanings of education. Yeah, so that, that's what I'm thinking, yeah. Thank you, Tang. Um, any quick thoughts on this, um, Wesley or Nimia? I can jump in just briefly, but I think that's a very tough question and I'd love to hear more from the audience as well because I think those diverse experiences will count. I just wanted to mention one quick point that the New York Times put out some time last year by Otto Steinmeier uh, talking about the 60 year curriculum of higher education. I was just trying to bring up the link, um, but you can Google it, 60 year curriculum for higher education. And I think this is really important when you think about employment and the future of work and how no one can actually answer that question right now. Uh, so we're, we're continuously evaluating and improving based on these feedback loops. And I, that's really what we mean by uh, the relevance of higher education, listening to people, listening to think critically about the place where you are based and trying to think about place-based relevance over the course of your lifespan. 60-year curriculum means that you're likely to you know, modularize higher education and come back to higher education at different points in your life for career development, for continuing uh, skill development. Uh, and reflection, because I don't think we're training for one job. I don't think we're going to be completely capable to get everything done in three or four years. What we're looking at is how do we continuously learn? And I think that's the spirit of the Sustainable Development Goal 4. Thank you, Wesley. Um, do you want to say anything, Nimia, on that? Yeah. Uh, actually, this is a major criticism as far as uh, flipping tertiary education is concerned, that for the longest time, the framework or the philosophy that has guided Philippine tertiary education is uh, the neoliberal framework, where uh, courses or degree programs are given a monetary value. And I think that is greatly uh, part, I mean, that is uh, to a certain extent because of the influence of the West on Philippine education. No? And uh, so uh, and, uh, to be able to operationalize that, Right now in the country, as a reflection of the neoliberal framework, this can concretely be seen in the emphasis on university rankings. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there is uh, so much uh, uh, fast being given to being able to uh, rise, uh, uh, to go up the ranks of the university rankings, whether this be PHE or uh, whatever. Then secondly is the marketability of courses translated, as you've said, into employability. So uh, uh, students are being influenced to take courses that are marketable or that they can, uh, that will allow them to go abroad to be able to uh, earn higher income and experience professional growth and development. You know? Now, so essentially that is the general uh, status or orientation of Philippine tertiary education. However, on the other hand, there are also counter currents taking place. For instance, mm -hmm. emphasis on relevance, being, you, being able to make use of tertiary education to be able to respond to the needs and interests of the Filipino people, especially the underserved and the marginalized section of the country. The issue of lifelong learning is another uh, principle that is being highlighted. No? So uh, 
uh, right now that is the overall status and orientation of tertiary education which many academics especially the progressive ones are trying to counter mm -hmm. can uh, can i add um one more point before sure. you move to the next one because this one uh, i just want to clarify because it's my research so i just uh, you know, like uh, take this opportunity is to cl uh, clarify you know so with the audience and hopefully so we understand you know the meaning of employment and employability is better so the, you know, so we're talking about commercial educations or funding and you know employment rate, uh, etc. So actually, so we just touch on the surface of the problem. So we tend to only talk about employment. That means you know so how do we obtain you know a job you know so after graduation. But like you know, um, Wesley's and Nimi just uh, touch on lifelong learning, and in my research, you know, so we talk about it's more important to talk about employability. It's not about employment. So employability here means yes, after obtain a job, you know, how we sustain, how we uh, you know, so remain on the job is more important. Because, for example, like in education, um, in at Monas, we, uh, you know, a lot of research we found, you know, after four or five years, 50 or uh, 40 or 50 of our graduates leave the teaching profession because they can't stay, you know, they can't sustain their job. So the, it's more important for our students to kind of learn the qualities, learn the, the resources, learn the, uh, the, the capacities, or, you know, in my research, I call capitals, to not only, you know, to get the job, but stay on the job. So, the, we, you know, so on the surface level, we tend to say like, you know, people have to, you know, do, you know, high education, master, PhD, and do one or two degrees to be able to get a job. But then if we only think about the name of the degrees or the qualifications without thinking about other qualities, for example, resilience, sustainability, psychological, you know, so how to suffer, how to kind of like build identity, we call kind of like those qualities, for example, like being honest, being loyalty, being kind of like, you know, so, um, um, teamwork, how to know, you know, so like respect other people. Those qualities are still very important in the labor market. And very important from the employer's perspective. But the problems for our education and the university, we tend not to talk about those qualities. We tend because we, we have commercialized education. So we tend to talk on the surface level only, like the student come in to complete the, 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 the degree because we want to get money, I have to say. So they, they complete degrees and then that's it. You know, so they have the qualification, but then the content, the, the qualities of the degree, we don't really talk about it. So, you know, so I have to say like, we have to I have like say sorry for students because if they do not recognize, you know, the other qualities and they will have the problems, you know, to kind of like keep them employable. So that's why I say, you know, so it about kind of like the, the, the puzzles, you know, how academics, we kind of like help our students to see, you know, the surface and also the content of the problem. Thank you very much, Tang. Uh, we have about five minutes left, uh, and I'm going to be ambitious and try to address at least two um, other areas, if, if you do not mind. Uh, we have a question here, somewhat related to the previous one, from Hope Anton, um, and it is on research grants. So it has been observed that STEM disciplines, that's the hard sciences, um, are prioritized more in terms of research grants. Um, and will this not deepen further the divide amongst the disciplines, and, and in this case, how can interdisciplinary research and approach be fostered so that it can address the issues such as COVID-19 uh, does that affects all aspects of life? So research grants, um, does anyone want to address that quickly perhaps? A quick response? Maybe, uh, Wesley, Inter yeah. Interdisciplinary research in, in, in this climate. <laughs> Yeah, that's a tough one. I'm, I'm not sure I have data at, the, at my fingertips to, to comment, um, other than to say that this is the time to, to draw on all available resources. Um, if you'd like, I can dig up some links for you about what multilateral banks like the Asian Development Bank, World Bank, what others are doing to mobilize resources uh, to promote research uh, and relevant research. Um, so Education International, the Teachers Coalition, others out there are doing rapid assessments, the Asia Europe Foundation, um, others out there are looking at how they can, you know, um, begin to fund uh, relevant research that can address the needs in each local community. But again, I would need to I would need to dig up some links to give you some more specific answers. Sure, Leslie. Um, would you like to add anything, uh, Professor Nimia? 
on uh, recent ones in this um, time of the cri um, crisis. In the light of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, I wouldn't be surprised if there would be a, uh, a, uh, an increase, a significant increase in uh, funding of research projects along health, medicine, te uh, equipment, technology uh, brought about by the pandemic. But uh, I think there are also, I mean, the, the areas for arts and humanities, uh, social and behavioral sciences uh, uh, remain to, uh, I mean, re remain to uh, uh, be given also uh, funding. But in, term, mm -hmm. I, I mean, but in terms of priorities, I think uh, the, the pandemic has uh, significantly uh, highlighted or uh, emphasized the importance of uh, natural, hard, the hard sciences, engineering, and technology. Mm. Thank you, Nimiya. Um, I think we might have just time for one question, uh, and this comes from Darren McDermott to sort of uh, all the panelists. What are the panelists' views on the medium-term prospects for ASEAN higher education, harmonization, and student mobility? Um, so Wesley, I wonder if you want to address that since it touches on recognition issues. Sure, and I love this question, and thanks, Darren. I know you're out there, and I know you have a lot to say on this topic. Um, so I think uh, the European Union has been a great supporter of harmonization efforts and through its EU SHARE project, so I encourage everyone to take a look. A big shout out to our friends there in Jakarta who uh, have been curating and facilitating this uh, with the ASEAN Secretariat and partners throughout the region. And I think our friends upstairs at CIMEO, uh, the Southeast Asian Education Ministers Organization, uh, the Secretariat here and CIMEO Raihead, there are a number of important organizations that are promoting the exchange of, uh, of important information about uh, quality uh, in higher education, including the ASEAN University Network. So in my five or six years in the region, I've seen just an, an acceleration and a commitment to collaboration within ASEAN and ASEAN plus three. So I think that's, that, that shows that this trend will continue into the future, and I think it's only a strength at the moment. Um, mobility, obviously, cross-border mobility is, you know, it's anyone's guess at this point about what physical mobility might look like, but in the future, I think virtual mobility has been dramatically expanded and new potential exists because of the, the, the crisis we collectively face. Thank you, Wesley. Um, we might have to wrap up now. So um, I would just give um, each of the panelists here today uh, a chance to wrap up and say one last um, few sentences, perhaps a, a few uh, concluding thoughts, uh, starting backwards now. So starting from Tang, perhaps uh, just uh, one minute of uh, closing remarks. <laughs> Um, yeah, so to, um, as I say, you know, so COVID-19 is kind of like exciting, <laughs> exciting opportunities for us to think, to reflect, you know, so on what we are doing and uh, what we have been doing and what we need to do better so in the future. And uh, maybe so I am kind of like optimistic, you know, so, kind of, you know, so I always think about, you know, so everything have pro and con. So um, yes, uh, definitely so we are suffering, too. we are facing a lot of challenges, but then, you know, like back to the, the you know the, the core points in my the presentation I say you know so if we think it um, like as an opportunity for us to try something new to, yes to think about the different ways and then yes so we may do something better in the future so yes uh, um, everyone to think positively and think about you know so the role of education positively we still need teachers you know <laughs> virtually uh, on you know in face to face and virtually so we still need teachers yeah thank you so much yeah. Thank you, Tang. Uh, and Professor Nimia, uh, just a, maybe one minute for closing remarks. Yes, maybe uh, I'd like to repeat what I said earlier that the COVID-19 pandemic has produced new, a new world full of challenges and dilemmas as well as opportunities. And it is up to us to adapt and transform the challenges and dilemmas to opportunities for the growth and development of our people and the global community. Thank you. And uh, finally, um, Wesley, any concluding well, thoughts? Thank you so much to the Head Foundation for facilitating and bringing us all together and you know, making friends uh, around the network because I think this is key. No one organization, no one partner can, can achieve what we need to going forward. I want to read a great quote that's from the Future of Education Initiative, the International Commission on the Future of Education. Um, COVID-19 has revealed vulnerabilities. It has also surfaced extraordinary human resourcefulness and potential. This is not a time for pragmatism and quick 
action, but it is also a moment when we more than ever cannot abandon scientific evidence, nor can we operate without principles. And I think our article with the Head Foundation articulates some of those key principles, but we're gonna to have to make some difficult choices based on a humanistic vision of education and development and a human rights framework. Thank you very much for this opportunity to join you today. Thank you, Wesley, good to have you too. Um, to just sum up very quickly our session today, Obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic has brought huge disruptive challenges for higher education and universities, colleges around the world, but also um, a silver lining for us to rethink what higher education really means um, for the world today, for the future. Unfortunately, we cannot take any more questions. So we had a bumper crop of questions, very good ones indeed, uh, over 60, I think at last count. Uh, but hopefully we have tried to address them in clusters as much as possible. Uh, nevertheless, the conversations continue. And so I hope you uh, tune into our future webinars as well as the future issues of HESB, which is our journal. Uh, I have not forgotten, uh, there will still be the results of our second poll question, which, which you remember we took at half time. So if we have the results now, um, as a precaution, should the upcoming semester be held online? Yes, is uh, I think quite a clear answer. Mm. Um, so thank you very much for your collective wisdom from you, the audience, uh, and thank you for joining us in this discussion. I've enjoyed this very much as I'm sure uh, you have. Please join me in thanking the panelists today. And uh, thank you for joining us. I hope you stay safe and well, uh, most importantly. Thank you very much and um, over to Vic Nash who will do the um, closing honours. Thank you very much, Ho Yong. And I'd like to take this opportunity on behalf of the Head Foundation to once again thank our three fantastic and insightful panellists for sharing their thoughts and their perspectives on what higher education is going to look like in a post-COVID-19 world. So Dr. Tham Phan, Dr. Wesley Tetter, and Professor Nimya Simbulan, thank you very much. And to my dear friend and the editor of HESB, Ho Yong, thank you very much for moderating the session. Ladies and gentlemen, we couldn't have done this session without you. So thank you. Thank you everyone who has attended uh, and who have asked so many insightful questions during this session. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. The Head Foundation will continue to host webinars as part of this COVID-19 What Next series. So please visit our website for more information about future webinars. And if you wish to continue to engage with us, please do write to us at rsvp at headfoundation.org. Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this evening's session, I would encourage you to visit our website and download the latest issue of higher education in Southeast Asia and beyond, HESV, our flagship publication, of which today's three panelists have contributed their thoughts and their perspectives on what higher education will look like in a post-COVID-19 world. We're happy to have many other leading academics and practitioners from the region and beyond who have penned articles for us in this special issue on COVID-19 and beyond. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And please do visit our website at www.hitfoundation.org. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. <laughs>